Welcome to episode 116 of Stageworthy. I'm your host, Phil Rickaby. Stageworthy is a podcast about people in Canadian theatre featuring conversations with actors, directors, playwrights, and more. If you haven't subscribed to the podcast, I'd like to remind you that subscribing is the best way to make sure that you never miss an episode of Stageworthy. And there are some great episodes coming up, so trust me when I tell you that you don't want to miss them. So make sure that you subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Music, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts to get every new episode of Stageworthy delivered right to your device. If you want to drop me a line, you can find Stageworthy on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at StageworthyPod, and you can find the website at StageworthyPodcast.com. And if you want to drop me a line, you can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Phil Rickaby, and my website is PhilRickaby.com. My guest is the artistic director of the theater circuit and playwright Massimo Pagliaroli. The Theater Circuit is presenting Massimo's Inch of Your Life trilogy with Part 1 opening March 8th at Theater Pass Mariah Backspace in Toronto. So... This project that you're working on mm-hmm. um, sounds uh, pretty epic, actually. Oh God, like, does it? <laughs> well, it does. I mean, I look, I see it, and I see the, I see part one, right, in in March. Yeah, and then I see it part two mm-hmm. a couple months later. Mm-hmm. What is this that you're doing? Well, what is this that we're doing? Uh, um, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Um, years and years ago, uh, we a friend of mine had a space in Kensington, and I. I was sort of, I was toying with this little idea of this little episodic kind of show where it's sort mm-hmm. of, you know, every month or so we have this core, you know, group of, of characters and we have every month you come and see a new installment. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, that's a little crazy because of terms of schedules and all that kind of stuff. So sure. we started just making it in sort of like actual episodes that every few months we would do. Mm-hmm. So it was very, very casual, very, very like... Uh, you know, rehearse on the whim and then put up and it done in a cabaret space with drinks and all that kind of stuff. So it was very like comedy review kind of idea. Sure. Um, and then afterwards it was, um, we refined it a bit, um, sort of cleaned it up, uh, really put things to paper mm-hmm. and, um, continue. We, we got as far as like four episodes, let's say. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they, a friend of a friend came to see that show and she was living in Los Angeles at the time and she said, uh, this is a really interesting project. Would you be interested in doing it over at Edgemar in Santa Monica? I'm like, uh, okay, sure. Why not? Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> you know, no, absolutely not. No, why, would, why, why would I do, why that? do something like that? Get out. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, that was like the, I think that was like the first time it was sort of like really refined and chiseled down into like a play form kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we did it there. And it did very, very well. And um, and then I stopped doing it for like a long time. I actually like left theater and said, I'm not going to do this anymore. Mm-hmm. I'm like, you know, I'm going to grow up and be serious and, and do that kind of thing. And then, you know, a couple of years ago, I submitted to the Fringe and I got in and, and we did a little test of that show. And I'm like, I kind of, this is an itch I haven't finished scratching. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I really want to do this, but I want to do it and finish it. Um, yeah. I want to do it as a trilogy um, and d- designed to be sort of like a sitcom on stage. It's sort of like a show that we we call it, we dub it a show for like the Netflix generation because sure. it's episodic, it's fast paced, it's it's it borrows heavily from, you know, sitcom style and sketch comedy review and uh, that's it. So it's basically three episodes at, that, in, that are one whole mm-hmm. and, you know, leaves the possibility open for a possible, I don't know, prequel or, you sure. know, for like doing the whole Star Wars thing. Let's say, <laughs> let's go before, like there's all this little universe we've, you know, mm-hmm. created and we can, you know, go back and forth and add to it if we wanted. But I just wanted to get that initial trilogy out of my head and finished. Sure. Um, and so that's the, and it, it coincided with us sort of starting our theater company. So we thought this is our inaugural season. Let's just, let's do this. Uh, you, you said that you gave up theater and decided that you were going to grow up. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. What, what, what prompted that and what was your growing up? What, what did you try to do? Okay, well, it, it's just very strange actually because – and it, it's funny because this actually ties in to the show. But I mean I, I don't know. I guess I, I turned 30 and I was, you know, surrounded by family and friends, all of the Italian background who were like getting married and having yep, kids and yep. buying houses and having jobs. And I'm like, I write plays and I do that. Mm-hmm. And it was just – 
you know, I, I guess I was sort of really thinking that, oh, that that's what I should be doing. I yeah. should be sort of like planning some roots and thinking about getting older and taking yeah. care of myself. And, and I was just miserable during all that time. You know what I mean? I started a little business with my cousin and, you know, it was like we had a little like cafe kind of thing and up in Brampton, like, you know, just so yeah. far from, you know, anything yeah. that, uh, that I'm familiar with or that, uh, and, and yeah, I'm just, it, the, the fringe, the 2016 fringe was me literally going back saying, you know what, universe, I'm going to try this one more time. And sure. if I get into this festival, then I'm going to take that as a sign to keep going. So that's yeah, what happened. The number of people, so 30 is a, is a, is an age where you start to, it was weird. And the, yeah. it, it was, it, I, it was the weirdest thing. Cause I'm like, Oh, I should really like, I should stop doing this. I, and I was doing well. Like, I mean, I was, yeah. you know, working and all that kind of stuff. Sure. I, it was just, maybe it got a little hard and I was like, you know, yeah, yeah I think I'm going to stop. I, I had that at 20, like I, that journey of like, no, going to stop started for me at 27. Mm. I had like a crisis from 27 to 31. Right. Where I just sort of was uh, trying to figure out, oh, do I want to do this? And you start to think to yourself, okay, so I'm getting to the point where maybe I want a place of my own. Maybe I would like to afford, I don't know, a computer and a TV and, yeah. you know, some things instead of like my little black and white TV that mm-hmm. I have from, you know, mm-hmm. you sort of think like that. And then you're like, okay, so maybe that seems good. But you know, most people that I speak to who've done that, it doesn't take. No, but the thing is, because I didn't want those things. I'm like, I don't right. want to get married and I don't want the house <laughs> and I don't want those things. So I was just really like, I, I was really torn between. Well, you, you really like, like went for the completely wrong reasons of like, I wanted like, I should have what these people have. Well, just because I thought like, well, if this is me at 30 without any of these things, what am I going to be like at 50 without any of these things? Mm-hmm. That's where I went. And I'm like, maybe I should sort of, you know, lay down some roots and yeah. kind of really think about, I don't know, who's going to, you know, take care of my teeth when I'm 60. Yeah, like, you yeah, know what yeah. I mean? Like, how's that going to happen? <laughs> so, so, do you know what I'm saying? So, <coughs> so that's, that's what it was. And, and there was never any pressure for my family ever. Okay. It was all sort of that, you know, looking around and saying, oh, is, is, is this what I should be doing? Because mm-hmm. everybody yeah. that I went to theater school also, you know, with, they, they were sort of getting married off and not doing it anymore. So I'm like... Am I like, it, it was, it, no. it, 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 I felt kind of like really like yeah. alone, There's, you know? I'm thinking about the people from when I was in theater school, mm. still doing it, you know, as we all approach over 40. And um, <laughs> there's very few who are still doing it. Absolutely. You know, it's not easy. It's not. You know, and you, you start to think, balance out the, you know, do I want... Do I want to make uh, below poverty? Right. Or do I want this? Is there something else I can do? And sometimes people pick up a high a side hustle that yeah. ends up being their main hustle. Yeah. And I don't blame them. Hey, that and that's I sure. get it. Especially if you have children, what you know, yeah, and I, I completely understand. Um, but for me, it was just after that, like seven, eight years. I'm like, you know what? I looked at the alternative, and it just wasn't appealing anymore. I'm Did like, you I up for eight years, like seven, eight years. Yeah, and I, yeah, yeah and yeah. I, and, and let me tell you something. Getting back into it. I'm getting back into it, whatever. The, but I, it's just I feel so behind. You know yeah. what I mean? I feel like I'm I'm trying to play catch up. You know what I mean? And yeah. and I, I'm kind of excited because it's you know it's coming at a time um, you know in the advent of like all the, this indie theater really really rising and and all that stuff. I sure. just feel I, it was a good time. Yeah. No. Yeah. I mean, uh, I how long did I live for? Three, four years, maybe. See, that's what I should have done. Yeah. That's what I should have done. But then, yeah. but then even then, like you come back and you're not quite in it. You do a couple of things, and I spent even longer not writing. Mm-hmm. I would say I'm a writer, and I would I wouldn't write. Mm-hmm. And then when I had the opportunity to write, like I, I did, like a I did Red Sandcastle's uh, Thousand Monkeys one mm-hmm. year, mm-hmm. and it just like opened the floodgates. And yeah. I was like, oh, this is what it feels like. So it was like like actually really good. Yeah. But it's it's hard to 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 feel like you're going back because once you say like. Oh, no, I'm giving it up. Yeah. Don't tell people that you're giving it up. The thing is, I, I don't think I, there was ever this like declaration. It's funny that you, I'm going on what you said. It was that idea that I kept saying to people, oh, I'm an actor. Or I'm a writer. I'm like, but I wasn't doing any right, of it. Right, right. Yeah. And it bothered me because mm. I'm like, well, then, then why am I working this job if this is what I should be doing? Sure. You know what I mean? And yeah. that's, it was, it was, it was, uh, really ate away at me until I finally mm-hmm. made the decision to sort of like, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't take for a lot of people. I mean, it didn't take for Daniel McIver, for example. He mm-hmm. made a big deal of doing his farewell tour. Yeah. Like his farewell, like performing all of his solo shows. Yeah. And then moving off to, to, to the Maritimes to settle down and then he's back at it. Yeah. Because 
it's you're, hard to give up. Yeah, it's the bug, man. It's yeah, uh, yeah it's 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 yeah. It went, and that's the thing. It's it's mm-hmm. it never. I knew that I would. It would bother me for the rest of my life if I just yeah. didn't say. At least I I went I, this this time now. I'm sort mm-hmm. of. Taking it seriously, but I'm not taking myself as seriously. Sure. And I think that just comes with age. Yeah. I'm sort of, for lack of a better word, hungrier for it now, but for the right reasons. Oh, because you you, you didn't have it for a while. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And when you give it up, it's like I think if you go from hot from if you were like doing theater in high school and then you went to theater school and then you graduate and you start to do it, mm-hmm. you don't know how much you need it mm-hmm. because you've never not done it. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh. That's just a bag. Oh, as yeah. long as it, yeah, that's all good. Is it my bag? I don't know. Is there anything in your bag? That, it's just it's no, your it's, bag. Did it? Yeah. Bag. Okay. Nothing. Nothing. Oh, there's my computer in there. Really fine. Okay. Where? It's a work computer. It's a work computer. Who needs um, that? Uh, no, and exactly. That's the thing. Coming to it now at this age, I just I'm 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 happier now. I'm sort of in a better place to do it, mm-hmm. and it's because I want to do it. Sure. And I'm I'm not. Yeah, I, I don't I don't think twenty two year old Massimo is, is the same as you know. Mm-hmm. Massimo today. Sure. I'm well, a, I, I hope not. Well, no, no. And yeah, okay. he, he was, he was, I think a little cooler, but I mean, the thing is, yeah, I, for me, I'm just, I'm happier doing it now mm. and I know why I'm doing it now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. What was your show in the 2016 fringe? It was, it was interview life episode one. Okay. We kind of did like a little test of it to see, cause it was my first thing back in like seven years and right. felt really rusty doing that. I didn't get into that one. Okay. We, no, no, it, we did very well. Like it was okay. great. It was, that's was why we sort of decided to sort of revamp the show completely yeah. and do it as the full trilogy. Sure. Yeah. Cause it was sort of, we got a, an interesting response and, uh, yeah, we thought we would just, uh, do it, do it the whole thing. What, did you, what did you learn from friends doing it? Is there anything in particular that, that I learned that, oh God, that you, <laughs> the theater, the directing stuff and the writing stuff is like any other kind of like muscle you need to work it I think often yeah. as you yeah. can because I felt really rusty mm. I remember being in rehearsal going I really hope no one can see through the fact that I don't know what I'm talking about right now <laughs> you know and I mean it all comes back to you but it was just really I'm more confident now directing this incarnation yeah. now that I sort of got that out of my system yeah. um, and I felt bad at, I remember at times working with the actors and just again I'm like I don't think I'm giving them anything I don't think that I'm doing my job mm. you know um but yeah, I also realized that I work well under pressure too. Mm. That was yeah. Well, yeah. Fringe does put a lot of pressure on you. Yeah, we were like we were very organized, but yeah. it was just like when it comes down to the wire, it's like you know it's a cast of eight, you know, uh, plus there's all these other like right. dates and times, and you're just you know navigating this whole operation. Um, but it's yeah, it's uh, it was it was a good a very good experience. Good. Yeah, good. we we wouldn't be here. I think no. if it, we didn't have that, we wouldn't be here. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, because Fringe. When it gets down to the wire, you suddenly realize all the things that you you think you're in good shape, and then yeah. all of a sudden there's like, did do this, is this, do this, and that's when you realize that oh nope, didn't do that. Yeah, and now it's a scramble. Yeah, you know. I, I the thing is, I thoroughly love being in the fringe because mm-hmm. the, the only t- I mean, I did it last year. Sorry, two years ago. The only other time I did it was 2005. Okay. Yeah. Um, and we had a great year and a great run. And I've always gone to see shows and things like that, but mm. this was my first time in a long time. Yeah. But I, we felt really, really welcome. Really, really, I felt really at home at, at there. That's good. Yeah, I, 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 I like I like the festival very much. Sure. Yeah. I really, I really enjoy enjoy Fringe. Yeah. I mean, I uh, just I love the the crapshootness of it. Yeah, me too. That you don't know mm-hmm. what's going to be good, what's mm-hmm. going to be bad. You know, you can just go and like take a risk on something. And, yeah. And maybe see something magic. And it's amazing how 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 it, it has been like the springboard for so many big productions. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I mean, I mean, Inns Choice. You know, Kim's Convenience. Sure. I went to school with Inns, and I just remember like seeing the progression of that. You know what I mean? Sure. It's it's amazing, and like Drowsy Chaperone, and like how there. You know, it can really, really, you know, sure blow up your show. Things things can absolutely and things can happen with, with like small shows that have like. Parlayed it into you know tours and things yeah. like that. So yeah, it's really absolutely. Really, I think that's why it's great. Oh sure, yeah, absolutely. Because it's a way to produce that doesn't mean that you're paying however much you're paying. For oh my god, absolutely like nine hundred dollars to like sort of like to do your whole. It's fantastic. Yeah. It's, it's a great, safe sort of you know comfortable way to do it. Sure. Yeah, and instead it, of like having to spend like who knows how much on a venue plus yeah. advertising plus all this stuff. And yeah, you, you're never going to get that kind of word of mouth outside of a festival. Yeah. <clears throat> What theater school did you go to? I went to York. York? Yeah. yeah. 
How how were you in the in the writing stream or in no? The- I was in the directing stream. Yeah. Okay, it's funny because I actually it's very funny how that happened because I actually went to York to become an actor and then ended up going through the directing stream and then started writing after I graduated. <laughs> so it's very it's and it's funny because I guess everybody always forgets about me as an actor because I've done more directing and writing than anything else. Sure, but the program has really changed too since when okay. I was there. Mm-hmm. It was very very streamed when. I was there. Your first year was very generic and your general. So you do kind of do everything. Mm-hmm. And then in second year, you you stream into either acting, directing, yeah. production, playwriting, and theater studies. Sure. So, and you reapply kind of every year. There's sort of like, a, you know, you have to get over the hurdle yeah. every year to get in. And um, I think it's changed quite a lot since I've been there because I've mm-hmm. spoken to recent graduates. I don't even think there's an undergraduate directing program anymore. I don't even know if that's there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's changed quite a bit. I think all the programs change. I yeah. Mean, they have to. Yeah. If otherwise... They become obsolete. From what I understand, there is like an acting stream. Then there's like a creative ensemble. Stream. Like they, it's yeah. There, I know that there's like a collective creation thing that you can do. Yeah, as well. Because when I was there, it was like acting, and that's it. Like right. if you weren't acting, you weren't acting, and that was it. Mm. You know, there was none of that other stuff going on. And so I'm just like, it's it's been a while. Like it's been a while since I've been in school. So yeah. and slowly now I'm seeing uh, if I look at some of them. Curious about how theater schools are changing, and I'll look and see. You know. What are they offering? And slowly now we're starting to see production, like self-production, yeah, as a as something. Because when I was in theater school, self-production was something they were like, you know, well, if you don't make it, I guess you could self-produce. You could do a solo show or or do the fringe. That was very secondary, yeah. absolutely right. Like oh, it was sure. sort of like they had a like running your theater company course, but it was sort of like yeah. this really weird. Don't have to take an elective. Whereas now it's. You know, I, especially in the college programs, like some of the actors that I mm. have, in, uh, they're working with in the show right now, uh, they have specific classes, courses, hours devoted to yeah. managing yourself and promoting yourself in this industry. Yeah. Whereas we didn't, I don't think we had that as in depth as they do now. No, we had, <clears throat> I went to Derek Brown, we had a business of acting course. And yeah. That's why I went there. It was one of the reasons I went there. Um, but now I think it's even more about like they'll do because now they're acknowledging the need to self-produce, which mm-hmm. is something that was never really a thing. Yeah, because we were being prepared to go to Stratford or Shaw, yeah, that sort of thing, and there wasn't a you know part of your career is producing your own stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, did you choose York for a particular reason? It's I was just as you were like about to ask me that question, I was thinking about how George. I would have preferred, I think, a college program. Mm-hmm. I don't regret. Any of my schooling, because I loved it. Yeah. And I, I, I really enjoyed my education. But I remember being one of three OAC students. Remember OAC? No, that's, remember yeah, that's, OAC, yeah, that's yeah. how far back we're going back yep. there. Um, but I remember, like, it, that back then there was, like, the streaming as well in high school. There was, like, sort of, like, the, you know, the, the three streams. And if you were the advanced stream, you automatically went to, like, university. Yes. That's where you're sort of, like, you know, geared towards. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Because Do you remember that? There was uh, the advanced. There was the general yeah. basic. Yeah, yeah. 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 And the thing is, you you could still go to like college if you were in the advanced program, but it's really funny because I remember like being one, literally a three, it was me, Mark, and Loretta, the three of us. And we're like out of a a graduating class of 200 Italians from Woodbridge, we're all like, you know, we're going to apply to theater. We want to do this. And, you know, our guidance counselors were like, okay, well, clearly you're, you're, you know, that you're going to go to university because this is where you're streaming into. And I'm like, okay, well, what university programs do I, I have looked at? I'm like, so York was one of them. But not once did anyone say to me, have you, do you know that like George Brown and there's all these other options for theater school no, of not. that are more yeah. geared towards like the business sort of, you know, sort of like, um, side of it kind of thing, really like finding work in the sure. city kind of, and you know, that your guidance counselor, like I've heard some of people go to the guidance counselor and the guidance counselor is like, Oh, you don't want to do theater. They, do that. I, don't, I don't think they even knew what to say to us because well, they, they were just like, you don't want to study business. I was no. like, okay, yeah, it was very strange. So you don't want to get your BA in English. You don't want to study business. You don't want to like what I don't understand. And, and I, I thought to myself, I'm like, if I was a guidance counselor and someone came up to me and said something like, oh, I want to do theater. I'm like, you know what? Let me see what's out there because we never get this kind of request. Yeah. I don't know. I did not know there was a national theater school. No, I didn't know that. No, and they obviously they were so blindsided <laughs> by it. You're probably like one of like three people every like five years who's ever said, I want to do theater. I think the following year there was one person who was like, I'm going into theater. And they never know what to do with that. You know? Because it's like they're, they think they're preparing you to go be scientists, doctors, lawyers, businessmen, all that stuff. And then you're going to go to. It was almost like theater. And then there was like a pause, like Ah! where where the crickets would be. You know what I mean? And, and, And I was. Yeah, it was really, and my, I remember like, you know, my, one of the, my, my colleagues actually did, you know, leave the program after a couple of years. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other finished the program, but then went into education. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, at the end of the day, like it really was only a very small 
very insignificant number from this huge graduating class. I just felt it was, I was very, um, what's the word? Not misguided. I don't want to say mm. that, but I just wish I had known there were more options. Sure. You know? Sure. And they, your guidance counselor just is, not, is unprepared for that. Yeah. Yeah. Because they're not prepared. They for just, they, the they didn't even, they didn't even say, mm. have you looked at, co-? like, they, it was college sure. was even an option. It was like, well, no. clearly you're in this stream, so you're going to go do, you know, the, the university route. I think that even if somebody was not in that stream, they wouldn't have known what to do. They wouldn't have been, they wouldn't have said their courses at college. They just wouldn't have known what to do with it. Yeah. I found out after. And the th- I mean, don't, like, York had a great program. Ryerson had a great program. They had great programs at the university level. Yeah. But I would have liked to have had Sort of, you know, a, a real array to choose from. And be like, well, well, this is the best tailor to what I want sure, to get out of the program. Your your university program is not going to prepare you. They're going to prepare you to be an actor. Yeah. Like, to act. Yeah. But in no way do you know anything about the business when you get out. It was it's very minimal. Like, you know, you graduate and you're like, have fun. Yeah. Have it was like, on. yeah, that's what it was. We were sort yeah. of like set a sail. And don't get me wrong. I mean, there were the professors there and the you know the the instructors there were very good. The actors, yeah. I think, got it more than the directors did. Mm-hmm. The actors, I think, had more. Um, exposure opportunity mm-hmm. where people came in to see them or they would do showcases at Tarragon and the, sure. so that they had that but as a director what, what are you going to do other than working with you know the you know the 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 graduate students who could then you know sort of I don't know put your name out well, there nobody, you can't nobody can see your directing work exactly especially when you're an and, AD and like you're not really directing anything and you know if they I mean? do see your directing work you've kind of done it wrong right you know right um, so it's hard to be to parlay the directing into getting seen yeah. Which is sad. And it's weird because, you know, usually it's the directors who try to do their own work. Too. I just wish there was more of that. Sure. You know what I mean? Don't get me wrong. Like, dissecting the scenes, all that stuff, mm-hmm. great. Yeah. You know, I had great instructors. I really, really, you know, had a fantastic time in mm-hmm. York. But then you leave and you're like, oh, okay, now what? Yeah. That's yeah, how yeah. I felt. Yeah, yeah, of course. That's how and I felt. That's, I don't think that's uncommon. I mean... I think it's very common. But I think that now, I think they've uh, they've sort of incorporated that into the curriculum where it's like... Okay, here's what happens, or things you should think about, or you're at least armed with some information as to where to go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Because um, you know, I, going going through the, the the college, the conservatory system, it's pretty intense. Mm-hmm. Like, it's theater from like eight o'clock in the morning till nine o'clock at night, and then you go home and you dream about theater. And on the weekends, you like study theater. Yeah, I spent all of my weekends at the the reference library. Me too. <laughs> I, yeah. The, the, the actors, again, had it more... The actors and the production students, like the production students were up all... They never slept mm-hmm. because they were doing their courses, but also, you know, producing the shows and sure, building yeah, the yeah, shows. Yeah. The actors had classes from like eight till six and mm-hmm. then rehearsal. Yeah. The directors had a bit more sort of flexibility, uh, but it was a lot of sort of like you you had to rehearse, you had to plan your own rehearsals, whereas sure. if the department didn't plan that for you, like you had to do all that. Oh, shit. Yeah. Yeah. So... Wow. But... I had a great time. I don't. Mm-hmm. I don't say it to like no. put down you no, know no. York because I actually had a fantastic yeah. uh, education. When did you start uh, doing theater? <laughs> like legitimately? No, like um, like even even public school counts. Oh, as a kid, I, I remember. Like I, it was. Oh God, I'll never forget. I there was. Um, I mean, it was always, it, like I always like to do like skits and things like that. Like at recess, I remember like pulling classmates and doing stuff like that. And then asking the teacher to perform them at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. And they were horrible, of course. <laughs> Just little things that we put up. But like, or like, you know, we would mimic things we saw on television. Um, I took, I think, my first acting class at six. Mm. And it was by a lady who had dropped off some flyers at the elementary school. Okay. And I went home and I said, Mom, I need to do this. And I remember it was at Albion Library, like in Rexdale, where we, where I grew up. And, and so I was like, you know, dead set on, on doing it, but it was only from like seven to like 12 was the age range. And so my mother like dragged me to the library and pulled the elite and said, you have to take my son because he's driving me crazy. <laughs> like, please let him take this class. And, uh, and, and that was it. After that, it was, you know, um, what I was, and it was funny because I never got to play the plum roles in like in, in, in elementary school. You know what I mean? I never got to do those things. Yeah. I was always sort of like the, you know, we did this big production of, you know, this French production of Little Red Riding Hood, and I, I, I didn't get to be the wolf or the woodcutter or anybody, like the person I really wanted. I was like, so I'm like, I will do it, I will do it. And I had to be like one of the little bunnies, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, like yeah. singing in the back, yeah. which is great. But at the same time, I was like, you know, I never got the chance to really show what I could do. Sure. And I don't know if that's what was the driving force, which was like, I'm going to do this. <laughs> when I got to high school, it was a whole other world because the drama department was actually really, um, promoted and taken care of like we had a fantastic mm-hmm. principal who was very very much about supporting the arts well that's good yeah so it was actually the the, the two ladies who ran the department were were 
you know, they, we had, we did things all year. Mm. So I really felt like, oh my God, okay, like I, yeah, I'm yeah, getting yeah. to do stuff. And that's when I started directing because we had student directed one act plays mm-hmm. and, you know, that kind of stuff. So that was, I think, where I was like, it solidified for me. I'm going to do this. But I think as early as, yeah, since I was a kid. When you found that flyer and you were like, I have to do this, mm-hmm. did you have any con- concept of what that what it was you were asking for? At that, at that I just saw it said acting classes and it had like a picture of a clown and like, you know, it was at the Albion Library and I'm like, it's what I want. I'm like acting. I want to, I want to do that. I want to, I want to be, you know, because I remember seeing like the grade eights putting on plays oh, and being on okay, stage okay. and I'm like, I want to do that. I, okay. I want to be up there saying stuff and performing and dressing up and you know, all that, whatever that that means. So you had seen something. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, and, uh, you know, and I remember like, you know, watching Sesame Street and, 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 and you know, performing in front of the television and then performing it for my grandparents. Mm-hmm. I always liked performing and being, I, I never felt sure. shy being in front of people. Right. Um, I don't know. It was just that thing. It was just that thing. I wanted mm-hmm. to do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And in high school, you were doing some some fun stuff, and then at what point did you decide that this is it? This is all I want to do. I think in high school, it was like this. Is, I think when I was a kid, I was like, you know, yeah, I'm gonna, I want to. You want to be, you know, on TV and things like that. But I think where it was like, you know, what I want to be an actor was high school. Mm. Yeah. And uh, is there a certain point where you realized that this was going to be the thing that you would do, like? Because, you know, some people, they think they want to be an actor, and then, but, you know, they'll also become a teacher. And that's what those no, I, I never, I mean, yeah, at the back of your mind, there's always that whole, should I have my backup plan? Mm-hmm. And I never did it. And I was mm-hmm. like, oh, that's kind of dangerous, you know, Mass, maybe you should really. But then I'm like, no, I'm like, I'm going to do it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I was, I was, don't, I was very excited, but also terrified. Like when I applied for university, mm-hmm. I was very, I'm like, okay, now I'm really doing it. You know, did you apply to the one school or were there other schools? Um, there were other schools. It's really funny because I actually had auditions for other schools and I just decided not to go to them because I wanted to go to York. Okay. I saw a production of As You Like It when I, in, in my last year of high school, we, I, I want to go see the productions of the universities that mm-hmm. I was, you know, looking at. And it was As You Like It directed by Jeffrey Highland. And it just, it took my breath away. I'd, mm-hmm. I'd never seen anything like that. Mm-hmm. It was a beautiful production and I'm like, I, I want to go here. I want to go here. I want to do what they were doing. And yeah, that was it. I mentioned it in my little interview at York. I think that's what sealed the deal. And that's what got me in because I, I told them that in my interview and they were all like, oh, you came on your own. That's kind of cool. Mm. Um, not a class trip. So I would think I scored some points there because my audition was horrible. <laughs> so um, yeah, it was really bad. Another thing, that's another thing too. It's like, you know, I didn't, I didn't know about all the, you know, the canon of plays out there, like the, you know, the Canadian stuff and all the good stuff. And it's what they teach you in school. So I had really bad choices for but my... But how could you... Like, I think we all did when we auditioned for theater school. Like, yeah. what do you know? Like, you don't know shit. But, so the, but like, the, yeah, I, yeah. I, I picked up, like, what, what, I picked up a book of Shakespeare monologues and a book of uh, modern monologues. So I could have, like, one modern and one one classical, and I learned one of each, and I... The Shakespeare was no problem. Yeah. I, I But I, then I... The, and I don't... I can't believe... This is going to go on... This is being recorded now. I did Tom from Gla- what did I know about playing Tom from Glass Menagerie at like seventeen years old? Sure. I'm like I could say this, I could memorize this in like a day. So that's what it was, and it was awful. Of course, I mean, yeah. we, I mean, what do we? Like, I mean, we go to learn. Yeah. Right? And so I, I think that they probably at, at theater school auditions see a ton of bad choices, <laughs> and they have to decide right. who like. Who has something that they can work with? Like, yeah. Whose bad choices show that there's something that, that, that you can yeah. like, build on? And it, I think I chose Glass Menagerie because I had to read it for school and I had it at, at home. Sure. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And it wasn't until I got to, you know, first year where you're reading all the Canadian stuff and mm-hmm. all the American stuff and all of a sudden the world just opened and I'm like, there's 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 so much out there that I just yeah. didn't know. Because what do you read in high school? You read Shakespeare and then you read a little bit of Oscar Wilde and a little bit of... Oh, Oscar Wilde, if you're lucky. like well, There was Oscar Wilde um, <clears throat> and Arthur Miller and Tennessee Williams. That's what you read. Yes, of course, because you have to, you have to be a salesman. Mm-hmm. Again, Great it's like the, the question of like why are we teaching the, like plays as literature? If there's any way to make to make kids hate the theater, yeah. it's like to force them to read and and analyze Shakespeare and Arthur Miller and yeah. like Oscar Wilde. Like, don't read them. <laughs> It's just the worst possible thing. I did I, I, on that note, though. I will say that I remember in grade twelve, I had a great teacher, mm-hmm. and I and she made me love Death of a Salesman because mm-hmm. it tough. yeah, it wasn't just like oh, we're gonna you know analyze it to death. Mm-hmm. Like we read it and we performed it, and mm-hmm. it's like okay, 
it just she showed us for the others the performance aspect of it, you know, and what it would sure. be like performing it, not just what it's you know saying. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was lucky that way. Yeah, yeah. I was taught Shakespeare by a woman who clearly had not read the play that we were. Is that the best? We yeah, that's the best. Um, and she would try to tell us about uh, how perfect the the language was and how perfect the the symbolism was, and there were no contradiction. And they were like, "You did not read this." Yeah, yeah. You, know, you have a little manual. Uh, yeah, do your desk. You've yeah, been told what to, what you think you want to say. Yeah, and whatever. Yeah, you know. We did. I remember grade nine was Julius Caesar. Oh, so they were still doing plays yeah. that were not the the main. Well, then they the changed floor. to Midsummer, which I thought was a, a, a sort of like a more fun entry point mm-hmm. to Shakespeare. You know what I mean? Sure. Um, because the Julius Caesar for you know fourteen year olds was pretty. It was like wow. Okay, yeah, Julius Caesar is a tough one. Yeah, like, there are some tough ones that they, that I've heard people say that you know I'm, we're doing Othello. Really? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Really? Othello was later, but I remember it was Julius Caesar for the mm-hmm. longest time, and they did Midsummer. And I'm like, we didn't get that. We did mm-hmm. like, and then you know. Even Romeo and Juliet would have been a good starter one. Sure. You know? Sure. But I mean, I think now, I, maybe it's changed, but for a while there, it was like, there's just sort of Midsummer, Mackers, and, and Hamlet. And mm-hmm. just cycle through. We did Lear. Mm-hmm. We did Lear in OAC. Mm-hmm. God, I feel really old when I, I say know, whenever that. You, whenever when I, oh, I know. Because no one so gets it. I'm like, know. oh, I see. They're like, what are you talking what about? A, what is OAC? Yeah. Well, there was a time, there was, children, yeah. when there was a period between grade 13 and now. Yeah. It's called OAC. Ontario Academic Credit. I remember that. Yeah. I remember like all the people who left after grade 12 and they already started their post-secondary and I'm like, I got one more year. Yeah. You know? Well, then there's the people who were in the, co- the double cohort year. Yeah. Which was like the when when they had to do the, the people who were finishing their OACs, the people who were not. And yeah. Were equal, but... But not, yeah. yeah. But not equal. Yeah. No, I, yeah. Yeah. That's so funny. I, God, the reminiscing about this is, it's really... It, it, yeah. It's, when you, you started writing, you said after theater school. I actually started writing, like, I mean, the first thing I ever wrote and put up was at York. Mm-hmm. Um, and the reason I started writing in the first place was because, you know, as a performer, I'm like, you know, I'm not going to wait to get a role. I'm going to write myself a yeah, role. Yeah, yeah. I was really, you know, the, the one man show was the big thing, you sure. know. And every time I started writing one man show, a second character showed up. And mm-hmm. I'm like, you know, and then because it's mine, I'm like, I want to direct it. So mm-hmm. the first thing I ever did was a little one act play that uh, York had a a sort of, uh, a sort of a fe- little a two it was called playground mm-hmm. so they would uh people would submit and it could be a reading it could be anything from like five minutes to 30 minutes and they chose uh you know each night had a different program so it ran in rep so playground a ran for four performances playground b ran for four performances mm-hmm. and it was alternated um and that was it i submitted i got in and then i we did this little play and that was the first time where i handed words that i wrote to actors and they were like mm-hmm. okay we'll say this and i'm like yeah. okay mm-hmm. okay that's good yeah. all right so it wasn't like yeah mass we're not going to do this <laughs> it was it was it, it, it was it was a real gift so mm-hmm. it gave me the confidence to write again sure which ended up being that friend show sure yeah. now, now you you're mentioning the one man show and how everything was about the one man show. yeah well had you seen something that, that made that well i remember something? when we had to do monologues in I didn't know what one man, I didn't know what that was, a one person show. Yeah. I didn't know what that was. Um, we didn't study those in high school. Mm-hmm. But then when you got to university, it was, you know, Diane Flax and Danny McIver mm-hmm. and, um, um, what's his name? Uh, 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 Garnum. Andy uh, Garnum? Andy Garnum? It was, we, there were so many yeah. being done. Uh, I remember there was even a publication called Solo mm-hmm. that was, you know, full of one, uh, one person shows. Yeah. And so that was a thing, mm-hmm. you know? And I remember like in Playground, there were people like doing them themselves. Yeah. And when my friends mounted stuff at the little theaters within the university, they did one-person shows. And it was just something I wanted to do. I still haven't done it, believe it or not. <laughs> so. I wanted to do it as soon as I read uh, uh, Daniel McCaffrey's Sleep... Uh, not Sleep... Wild, Sleep, Wild, Wild Abandoned. Wild Abandoned. Yeah. Fucking rap. And then I, read, then I read House and I was like, oh, you can do even longer. Like, you can... You can do this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Because while the band in, that was uh, when we had to do monologues, people that's where people would oh, pick fuck. from. While the band so- and see Bob Run, oh, those yeah. were huge. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's gold. It's great material. Yeah, it's just me. Yeah. It's just me. I yeah. got to share any with that. It was. It was a very. It, it really could show what you did. Sure. Yeah. And then and then you know, fringe. Like now, it's like the explosion of, of one person shows mm-hmm. and. And uh, almost sometimes the backlash against one person shows. I know people who were like, I just can't see any more one person shows. You know what? I, I guess, I don't know. I, I do like them. Uh, the last thing I saw Daniel McIver do was, was oh, I think it was Cold de Sac or, mm-hmm. or, yeah, Monst- no. or Monster that we're talking years ago yeah, yeah, yeah. that Monster, I saw. There was Monster and then there was, uh, this is 
So there was another one that was... Anyway. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and, but the thing is, and I hadn't seen one in a really long time until this past, uh, past year at the Fringe, uh, my friend Ada had one, mm-hmm. and I, I loved it. I forgot how much I really loved When they're yeah. well done, they're wonderful. Well, that's the thing. When they're really well done, yeah. you just... Like you could just get swept up. Absolutely. Somebody. She took me yeah. on the ride and I had such a great time and I was like, yeah, yeah. I, I, I just, I remembered how much I like doing them yeah. one day, one day. Yeah. You, I mean, you saw, you saw Danny McCaffrey perform once. So I've like, seen him do uh, twice. Okay. Yeah. So I'm do monster uh-huh. and I saw him do cul-de-sac. Okay. Those are the, I've seen him perform twice. Yeah. I saw, I saw, I went to see in his farewell tour. I went to see him do house. Yeah. And it was like, it was so magical to watch him perform that yeah and it was even watching that i didn't realize until i until uh, i was trying to perform my own solo play that i realized how important the audience was Mm -hmm. because i had never considered about how important the audience he opened my eyes to that too because my final i guess thesis if you will for my fourth year i did this as a play by danny mckyver Mm -hmm. And, and he, he taught me that it's, it's, he taught me the, exactly what you said. It's like, it's our responsibilities to them, but we can also use them. It's, it's a whole, mm-hmm. that whole communal thing. And, yeah. and it, yeah, it's always stuck with me, even now, like with yeah. what we're doing now, like with the, it's just the audience plays a huge part. Yeah. I, I don't know. He, he opened my eyes to the possibilities of what you could do with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And why you're doing that. Well, I mean, that's another important question, the why yeah. and, the, and the who, cause I, when I was doing mine and my director said, okay, so, so, you know, you've seen partners, the audience, you're going to make eye contact. I was like, what, 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 what? Yeah. Um, and once he said that, I was like, oh, of course I'm going to have to do that. Mm-hmm. And doing that the first time was like one of the most terrifying things I ever did. But yeah. then after that, like the realization that, oh, without that, it would be me talking at them. Yeah. Which is not engaging, but talking to them yeah. is a more, uh, gratifying experience for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I'm just uh, thinking yeah. back about that show. Yeah. That was, a, that was, God, that was a long time ago. What, what, it, as a director, yeah. now that you're directing, you know, you're, now you're directing this trilogy yes. of, uh, of your own work. First off, how does it feel like directing your own work? Is there, do you find it difficult to, uh, divide the writer from the director? Sometimes. Mm-hmm. I think that one thing I need to do at some point, very, very soon, is to write something and let someone else direct it. Have you done that before? No. Mm-hmm. No. It's never happened because I've only written like a handful of things. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've always, because I've been very clear about how I want it to look and sound, and I've been very precious about it that way, where I'm like, only I, I need to sort of realize this whole vision. Mm-hmm. Kind of, and uh, so so I've, I've always directed stuff that I've written. Mm-hmm. So I really, really need to I think I really should write something and, and hand it over I think I need to let someone else sort of like take the reins and w- does this work like yeah. to really work with them to be like is this well, that's, I mean, work that's, in tandem with a director that would know? definitely be a very interesting experience yeah I want to do it it has yeah. to happen because it's so easy to when you can direct it but then to see somebody else to like interpret mm-hmm. that's mind. what I mean that's what I mean I need to sort of see like what what do you get from this yeah yeah it's hard. It's something that's hard to let go. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. not just as a writer, but as a performer. Like I've performed something that's that a few things that are like open enough to interpretation that the audience can have their own opinion of what happened. And at a certain point, you want to be like, no, 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 no. This is what's actually happening. Yeah. And then you have to finally accept that. Oh wait, this is how what it is for them, and that's as valid as what I think it is. Yeah. I, I took a, a, a writing intensive with Paula Wing at Tarragon uh, about a year and a half ago, and it was all that. Where mm-hmm. it was like, she goes, I don't want anything about it. Just bring your pages in, say who you want to read. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, so with like no direction whatsoever, like they're just going to read it with like nothing. And it was a real eye opener because I'm like, that didn't make any sense. They're like, this did not come across. Mm-hmm. Whereas it was a real, it, it was a very, very helpful exercise because it's like on paper, you think it makes perfect sense. Sure. So you give it to people who know nothing about it and like, this doesn't work. Well, that's because, that's because, you know, when it's in your head, you yeah. understand all that stuff. Absolutely. I'm like, you, you don't get it. it on the paper. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, you didn't say it like that. It was very, very, very um, interesting. Yeah. And sometimes painful because you're sort of like, you know, it's very cut and dry. They're like, this isn't coming across. And, but then you realize you're like, okay, that's beneficial. Yeah. And it's really helpful to do that, I find, with the things that I've written. Have somebody just sit down and read it and not tell them. I do that so much more yeah. now. Yeah. I never used to, like, I never, I, now especially, I'm just like, can I give you guys some pages? I need to hear it. Sure. I need to hear it. Yeah. And, and be honest. Don't tell me that you, yeah. Because that's the only, like, if they don't understand it, then you really understand that there's something missing. Yeah. 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 I'm all about that. I'm all about, like, please come over. I'll bring, I'll have wine. Let's just read these pages. Mm-hmm. Do me the favor. Yeah. 
I do that a lot more now. I think before I, before I was too scared, you know, in my youth, just like, well, you know, and being very, very protective of it. But now I'm just like, no. I mean, I acknowledge the fact that it's a vulnerable thing to mm-hmm. give something that you have created to someone else to read. Yeah. So you want to make sure that they understand. Yeah. I'm doing air quotes. Which no, is, uh, no, no, no. I'm, I, 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 yeah, yeah my, my fingers are tired. Sure. I've been doing, yeah. Um, and so you want to make sure that they understand. But then you're robbing yourself of the opportunity to find it if they understand. Yeah. You know. I think it's such a healthy exercise. Mm. And I and, and it reminded me of it reminded me so much because I hadn't done it in such a long time. Um, it reminded me so much of theater school of just like mm. you know being there in the class and just seeing what everyone else is how they view your work. Sure, it just you've been sort of like it's been in your head for so long. But yeah, it was it was fantastic. It's such an interesting experience to to, to give things to other people and just find out how they interpret it. Mm-hmm. And you know, things can be so very different. But still come out the same way. Yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. It's just like one of those fascinating things that the way the human mind works. Um, in this current project, and it's called, again, I'm sorry. Inch of Your Life. Inch of Your Life. Yeah. So this has been through a couple of iterations. You know? Yeah, it was workshopped in Toronto. and Ken- This is our timeline. It was sure. workshopped in Toronto, in Kensington, many moons ago. And then it received like its U.S. debut at Edgemar. Mm-hmm. Um and we sort of called the fringe its kind of debut, mm-hmm. um, but this is sort of like the big. This is now the final sort of. We're sure. doing it now. But was, yeah, was what was done at Edgemar much different from what was done at the fringe? Yeah. Uh, the, here's the thing: the one that was done at Edgemar was the fringe one was a very similar to that. Mm-hmm. But after after not doing it for so many years and seeing it again at the fringe, I'm like, uh, uh-uh. uh. Went back to the drawing board, kind of like revamped everything, and now it's sort of like it's changed a lot. Is that lesson of like, oh, I'm not the person that I was when I wrote? That. Yeah, you know? I mean, it, the thing is, it's still kind of the most personal thing I've ever written, mm-hmm. but the, it just it didn't it, it didn't it didn't speak to me the way it once did. Mm-hmm. the The kernels were there, and 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 what I wanted to say was there. The ideas were there, but I'm like they weren't flushed out as much as I had wanted them to be sure. flushed out. Yeah. And it was a different show then. Mm-hmm. Whereas now, I, th- I it's just it's it's sort of it's grown and it's sort of it's evolved, and I it's I think it's strongest now. Mm-hmm. I, I feel happy about it now. Sure. Yeah. And so, okay. First off, I need to I need to back up because you yeah you had something that was like performed in the states. Yeah. Um. How how was that? It was, it was, you know, this Canadian kid from Woodbridge. Yeah, it was, it was very strange. Did you go down? Yeah, I I directed the show there. And, um, it was, uh, it was, uh, the way way it worked is a, a, a friend of a friend who was in the show had seen it and we had talked about working on something together and then she had, uh, gotten her green card. She was an actor and and she was going over there, but she was part of this theater group at Edgemar, Mm -hmm. um, and they have this thing called the Lab Series, where they they you know people can young companies or young writers can pitch shows, and mm-hmm. uh, one of the stipulations is you have to sort of cast within the company that they have. So, you know, uh, my colleague was like, "This I, let's pitch this, let's do it." Mm-hmm. And so I was like, oh, "Okay." I'm like, they didn't know me from a hole in the wall, so I'm like, "Sure, why not? What have I got to lose?" Sure. So we pitched it, we did a reading of it, and they voted, and they voted the show in, which was mm-hmm. great. Um, and it was great because they gave us this, like, it's, you know, the, the, the full studio theater, like, it, you know, full performance, all that kind of stuff. And they, they, it was the first time I actually saw it as a play mm. kind of thing. Yeah. Um, the funny thing about it is that there are some, uh, I mean, it does deal with some Italian characters and Italian Canadian is very different than Italian American. Oh, okay, okay. So the minute we had auditions, I remember we, you know, all the, the, especially the, the Italian characters are male and female. Uh, whereas here, you don't have any kind of accent. There is sort of like a downtown or a Woodbridge accent. Sure. Whereas over there, they start talking like this because right, automatically right. Italian American is like Brooklyn, Staten Island. Sure, yeah, yeah, and I'm yeah, like, yeah. whoa, this changed. It changed everything. It has such a different tone to it, uh. um, which was really, really neat to see. But uh, the thing is we did two episodes and then the sort of the lab series kind of like petered out. Mm-hmm. So we never finished. Oh. So that's why this has sort of been this like long standing. Oh, sure. So that's yeah. why it was sort of like, we're doing it now as mm-hmm. a trilogy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, when it went to the States, uh, the, the producer who, my friend who had brought it over, uh, she said, instead of doing it as some, this long running serial, let's do it as a beginning, middle, end. Three parts, trilogy, so it's a whole, but mm-hmm. three parts. Sure. And I'm like, I like that structure. Yeah. So that's what it has become. Right. Yeah. 
still keep it still being very sitcom-y in that kind of idea sure. uh, in terms of its structure, its pace. But um, now instead of it just being this long running continual, because mm-hmm. uh, the, the whole intention was that we kept, we would keep doing it. It's hard to get people to commit to that. Well, I mean, the thing is, that's that was the thing. It was sort of hard to get an audience to commit to that. You're telling me, yeah. yeah. Um, we like it's different. To, yes, in a, the the keeping the cast intact was the big thing, mm-hmm. especially with actors. You know, it's sure. like we weren't able to pay anybody much, so the minute they got a gig, I don't blame them. They'd have to go off and you know of they course, got yeah. they got to do. What you do. Um, so, but this time when we actually had the auditions and we finally decided to do this, we we made it very clear like we'd like to keep the cast intact for all three, right. just for cohesion and just for you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's. Quite exciting to know that it's finally going to come to fruition after like so many years. Yeah. yeah. What's the? I mean, is the the because you're putting a, a couple of months between it, so mm-hmm. being like a weekly thing. Yeah. Are you hoping that that become makes it an event that an audience is more likely to uh, seek out? Um. Like, because you know, if you if you missed the first one, how would it? Say, well, that's it actually that's happen? yeah. The thing is, each well, there is. There is a built-in recap. Okay. Uh, so each one, but the thing, the whole thing is that each one should be able to stand on its own. Sure. But as part of the whole structure of it, there is a um, a recap that the actors perform, just sure. so you're you're caught up. Okay. In the original incarnation, we actually had the recaps printed in the program, so you knew exactly what was going on. Sure. Um, also, in the original incarnation, we had guest spots. So we had new characters coming in, very much like a television show. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. the whole idea behind it was like, you know, if this ever takes off, we can have, like, Toronto Notables be sure. those guest stars. Yeah. Um, but as as the show sort of, you know, became what it is now, we decided that this initial trilogy is just going to be the eight characters playing yeah. everybody that they need to play. And then should we ever do more, then we'll sort of, like, broaden the scope and, and, and bring in other people. Because it is fun to sort of have that recurring cast, and then you sure. have those guest spots. Sure. You know? Sure. I'm doing air quotes, too. Do you oh, see those? Yeah. See okay. Quotes. I wish you could all see we this. See the yeah. air, air we see the air quotes. quotes. There's a we lot of air quotes. quotes. There's yeah. so many gestures going on. Yeah. Um, it's interesting, the, the, like, because it has a lot of potential to be an event, mm-hmm. right? And this is what I think a lot of people are thinking about in terms of what is theater going to be for the for a younger audience. Like, what is it that keeps it relevant? And it's not the classics. It's like, how do you make this an event? Well, that, I mean, when, when I first came up with it, or like, I mean, I'm not the first one to do episodic theater. Like sure. that's, you know what I mean? It's been going on. Everyone does it. But for me, I did it because I just want to see what the challenge would be like to sort of, you know, we're, we're up against, there's so much entertainment at our sure. fingertips, like yeah. in the advent of like Netflix and yeah. Crave TV and all that stuff. Like, why do you have to leave home? You know what I mean? Well, that's the thing is you have to give you have to give the audience something they can't get. Yeah. From Netflix. You know, so but yeah. the, but borrowing from things that you know do work like mm-hmm. the sitcom structure, sure. the comedy, yeah. you know, the ensemble cast, the fast pace. I'm like, how do we get all this and make it and put that on a stage? Mm-hmm. So the play is very stripped down, you know, it and it's it's very very simple. It really is just actors and dialogue and a few hand props. It's it's very very this is it, mm. you know? Um, yeah. And, and the response has always been very, very warm and, and people have enjoyed it. And there's a bit of a, you know, cliffhanger at each one. So that's, well, sure. you know, we kind of want to, we want to, yeah, we want to entice you, you back. back. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I'm, we're, I'm very curious to see what happens. Sure. You know, yeah. um, this is, I think the first time we're doing it on this scale in Toronto mm-hmm. where it's like, there's been a lot of promotion behind it. We're very yeah. excited. The actors are really excited. Sure. I'm I'm excited because I'm finally going to get to see it. You know, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's uh, I've I've been really lucky because everyone who's ever worked on it has been fantastic. So, uh, I yeah, it, it has gone through many 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 changes to sure. get to here. One of the things I always love about theater is how you know you can have a stripped down version, which have a couple of chairs mm-hmm. and some props, and it will still work because you don't need like a full set. Yeah, well, I mean, I worked at I did Tony Tina's wedding for a number of years, and this was back when they were at uh, on uh, Blue Jay's Way, mm-hmm. and Tony and Tina's was housed in the, you know the, the the Second City building, yeah. so we had access to we got comps to the shows. Yeah, and I was always really taken with how they did stuff with just a couple of chairs and yeah. a couple of props. And the fast pace. So I also borrowed elements from that idea. Sure. So it is a play, but it's mm-hmm. very stripped down and very like it's the chairs become everything else. I love that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And for yeah. me, I love playing with that theatrical device where it's like this glass is a glass, but then it becomes something completely different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we believe that. 
I, that's what I wanted it to be. I wanted sure. it to be like about the words and the actors, but it's just we play with all that theatrical device. Sure. And you know, there is there's other surprises to it. I don't want to say it all. Okay. You know, like come see it, of course. But <laughs> but uh, yeah, like it's it. I don't know. It, it's a, I think it's a, it's a, I think it's a unique experience. Well, that's great. Yeah. Master, well, thank you so much for. Oh my us. God! Thank you. This has been great. <laughs>